Well, hello, this is Mark Wilson speaking, and thank you for listening to this recorded talk. Of course, I'd like to first start by thanking Naomi and Shane for organizing the symposium, uh, in particular, despite the extraordinary circumstances that we all find ourselves in. So, of course, a real treat for me to be able to speak to you about the recent results from my lab here in Toronto. Now, as it happens, the spirit of the symposium aligns very closely with the overarching aim of my research group just to use spectroscopy to study exotonic materials for novel applications to understand and control energy and charge transport through these multi-component architectures. And as a result, our investigations span synthesis, fabrication, characterization, spectroscopy, and I want to emphasize two recent research stories here. The first, I want to talk to you about what we've learned and are learning about the colloidal synthesis of lead sulfide nanocrystals. Indeed, depending on how fast you read, you might already be well ahead of me and straight to the punch lines. We used fluorescent spectroscopy to observe distinct cluster type intermediates pervasively in the traditional synthesis of lead sulfide nanocrystals. We learn how these intermediates can be controlled using process additives and find that a straightforward extension to the Sugimoto type models of nucleation and growth accounts for our, our observations. We imply this understanding to improve, at times significantly, the size dispersity of our materials. This flattens out the energy landscape, and we're looking to use this to improve transport in our devices. In the second story, I want to talk about the intriguing behavior of a rigid, weakly coupled tetracine dimer as a triplet fuser, and what hopeful news this might carry on the ultimate limits of efficiency in triplet fusion upconversion. However, I should first make clear how these studies relate to the broad target of our current research, which is understanding how to assemble different kinds of exotonic materials to achieve exotonic photon upconversion. Indeed, you can see that's the big title in the top left. And though this is a top that is seeing growing interest, I don't yet feel that there's universal awareness, so the application is worth motivating. So with an audience of savvy physical chemists, I don't think I need to take too much time to explain this. I just want to emphasize that photon conversion is truly changing the color of light while conserving energy by trading photon energy for photon number. We are trying to reshape an input spectrum and give a different spectrum of colors that is better suited to our applications. The kind of applications we can talk about are really rather varied and generally start with the, the grand challenge of the field, which is the idea of reshaping the input solar spectrum to better harness the energy of light. You know, this is the idea of surpassing the shockley quiser limit using a non-tandem cell type geometry. And of course, it's this long range dream, once we can get our materials to be cheap, to last for 50 years and to have essentially perfect efficiency to compete with other ways of doing this. For that reason, though, I see it's a long range challenge. I'm really interested in the short term of exploring some of these other more niche and nuanced ways that we can exploit photon conversion to do interesting things. You know, one that's not at all new really is the idea of using upconversion, particularly in biomedical imaging. This exploits the fact that almost nothing in nature naturally emits light that is bluer than the light that it absorbs. And so you can achieve essentially background free imaging of biological structures. So although those in the audience will be aware of ongoing work to achieve this kind of performance through multiphoton microscopy or length that I do upconversion nanoparticles, there's still more that could be done here, particularly if we could use exotonic upconversion to enable biological contrast at very low intensities, there is a wealth of biomedical information that could be gained. However, two applications that are coming more recently, kind of enabled by the advances that have happened in the last couple of years, I want to mention at the bottom. So on the right, we can talk about the broad field of photochemistry, and particularly photochemistry sensitized by nanocrystals, which is in the middle of an explosion of various forms of research. I suspect I'm not the only person in the room inspired by the intersection of the two results that I highlight. The first from Ben Ravitz, Andrew Pundinal, who took advantage of upconversion using organometallic sensitizer to pool together the energy of red photons to make and break chemical bonds uh, without having the nonspecific damage associated with UV irradiation. And the second, the recent work from the group of Emily Weiss, where they're showing some of the interesting performance and selectivity that can be got by involving nanocrystals directly in photocatalytic schemes. And one of my favorite applications, one we'll talk about a little more, the idea of trying to use an upconverting film to sensitize a silicon focal plane array. Really, the silicon detector is one of the most effective technologies we've come up with. So the idea of giving it the ability to see a little bit into the infrared could be enabling. 
However, all these, particularly when we're talking about upconversion, face the same general challenge. It's the fact that upconversion is essentially a second order reaction in photons. So for this reason, it works better at high intensities, but here I am putting in front of you applications where the intensity is either limited or it would be much better if it would work when it was low. And so as a result, the field of exotonic conversion evolved and arose to take advantage of temporary energy storage. You know, in second order, it's the concentration of excited state speedies that give the rate of the successful process. So if you can build up a large population of excited states, you can have the bimolecular process be quite efficient, even in the face of monomolecular decay channels. And so this has been done in a number of schemes, including glanthidide dope particles that I won't have time to talk about. And instead, I want to talk about the time of conversion that we can do in conjugated organic molecules, exploiting the general property of their excited states. And this is that spin is a good quantum number. So we have a spin singlet and spin triplet manifold for the homolumo type excitations that the homolumo, unless we're trying really hard, spatially overlaps. So the exchange splitting is large. So this means we have three states we want to take care of, an emissive excited stinglet, we have an excited triplet state that is spin forbidden from emitting, which means it is extremely long lived. And this is going to be our energy reservoir. And if we have, as is common conjugated organics, the energetic landscape so that two triplets have enough energy to combine and make one singlet excitation, we now have this way to store the energy of photons in these long lived triplet states and to fuse these excitations together to get a more energetic emissive singlet. However, the same sort of spin selection rules that keep the triplet state long lived also make them dark. And so they generally don't absorb directly. And the general approach in this field is to use a sensitizer, another species that has a bright absorption and can produce spin triplet excitations through intersystem crossing and then donate these over to the, we'll call it the annihilator, the emitter, the fusing molecule, the one that does the business and puts these together. And this has been explored extensively using organic metal complexes. I highlight here the work of Phil Castellano. Tim Schmidt has also made many contributions. But what's new here and what's been recent in the last couple of years is using a different class of materials instead of the organic metal complexes to do the sensitization. And these are colloidal quantum dots because they have very different excited energy landscapes than the conjugate organics. I don't have time today to get into the beautiful things that are known about the fine structures of the system. So I want to summarize it very crudely that because spin dephasing is rapid, in fact, spin is not a good quantum number, and that the fine structure all is well within KT in most of these materials at room temperature, we can treat these as effectively a two level system, one where you can excite to the band gap or in fact with photon energies above the band gap and very rapidly on the time scales of most of the other energy transfer processes that we're gonna talk about, you have a functionally spin mixed state. And so now we can start to use these materials to sensitize. And we might do this because, for example, we can make infrared quantum dots with much more ease than it is to make infrared active organic chromophores. Or we can use the fact that the surface of the colloidal quantum dots is modifiable to assemble all in one chromophores that might be able to use some sort of self contained up converting dye. The general scheme then is to set up something that is sensitized by a semiconducting nanocrystal that absorbs the red light that spin mixes rapidly and transfers that to sensitize the spin triplet state in organic molecule. The triplet organic there either diffuses spatially or energetically through a film, comes together and makes the green light. This is something that I demonstrated at the end of my postdoc at MIT working with uh, Dan Krongri, Monk Fei Wu, and the groups of Munji Buendi, Vladimir Bulovic, and Mark Baldo. And we showed that this worked. And in fact, it worked quite well, right? We ended up up converting from beyond a thousand nanometers. If you know, there's controversy of how you define this. If you go right to the tail of the up conversion in this spectra here, where I show and cross the photoluminous excitation, we were observing the red emission spectrum at 612, while we were exciting within laser at nearly 1.1 microns. And so this was a new regime. Not only were we doing this in the solid state with a film of rubrine on top of a film of lead sulfide nanocrystals, we are doing this very red indeed. And I must point out the uh, work that happened at the same time. This is Ming Li Tang and Chris Bardeen working at UC Riverside, and then Mikhail Samgoff collaboration with Phil Castellano, who also put out nanocrystal sensitized work at that time. So how well did it work? Well, this is a plot that I want to explain because we're going to talk about it a bit more when we get to the work on the dimeric up conversion. I started by saying that photon conversion is a second order reaction in photons. 
By this means, there's not just an efficiency, there are many efficiencies. But you get to a saturating efficiency once you're driving the system hard enough for that second order process to dominate. And so there's this threshold that I'll draw here when we roll over from a second order or first order paper that's useful. And so not only were we able to achieve some sort of efficiency, which in the first devices was relatively low on the order of 1%, we had this threshold at about 12 watts per centimeter squared, which is about 100 suns. So that's it's far too great to be used in a practical solar cell, but it was pretty good for a proof of concept device and comparable to what some of the best lanthanide type materials had achieved after a long study. And so then as a physical chemist, you do the usual sort of things. Well, why isn't it better? We looked at transfer of the interface. We found that this dexter transfer, so this double electron uh, exchange that happens between the quantum dot and the, the materials of the surface, and it's a process that is studied more and becoming richer as we speak, is very slow but can be extremely efficient, particularly if you shorten the ligands as you expect, you would get this to accelerate and get reasonable efficiency. But what was very curious is although we could approve the efficiency reasonably and it, it looked like the organic film worked pretty well, we couldn't improve the threshold well and it was hard to thicken the lead sulfide nanocrystal layer to absorb enough light to get this working at truly low intensities. And so then we come to Toronto and we're trying to make this better, right? A general idea, if you want to get transport, is to have as flat an energy landscape as possible, right? There are many orders of disorder and the idea of trapping excitations at low energy sites is very common. So what we wanted to look into is can we make lead sulfide better so that they are all the same? The end gap, because it's a quantum confined material, that means that they're all the same size. So what do we know about synthesizing lead sulfide that are at the right energy? And what we knew were that lead sulfide quantum dots with the optical gaps that we were looking for were conspicuously mediocre from a synthetic perspective. I show here at right the summary plot we put together, compiling all the literature results and organizing reported lead sulfide quantum dots by their size and or optical gap and their ensemble line width. And by that, I mean, because these are quantum kind material, if they are size dispersed, that will contribute to the line width of the emission due to heterogeneous broadening. And what we found was with dots for physical size around three nanometers, or indeed for sextonic peak energies about 1.3 electron volts or just beyond 900 nanometers, the kinds we were looking for for a up conversion was that their full tap maxes were large, six, eight, or 10 kT, and looked larger than the well-optimized, slightly larger dots that seemed to work better. What did this mean? Coming in from physical chemistry background, the thing we knew about nucleation and growth was this kind of lamar dindiger picture, this hot injection, where you have this graph that shows the concentration of your precursor, your monomer, your solute, what you want to do, and that it rises, you nucleate the cores, and then they grow. And what's you know, hoped for in this is that you can start all the nanocrystals growing at the same time, and then as they grow, they all end up roughly the same size. And so to summarize rapidly, the extension of this by Tadao Sugimoto and enhanced and elaborated by many others is that this works a little more subtly in that if you have growth that is size focusing, by that I mean smaller dots grow faster than larger dots, which can happen if diffusion growth is controlled, then the minimum size dispersity is reached near completion. By that I mean even if the dots don't all nucleate at exactly the same time, they will end up uh, converging to a smaller size dispersity as the reaction goes on. And then following on from this, because many of these processes are self-referential, at reaction completions, so when you've exhausted your precursor, uh, your supply of precursors, the average particle size will vary inversely with the number of nanoparticles. So you can think of that, the more nanocrystals you've started growing, the more widely partitioned your precursor are, and they'll end up smaller at the end of the day. And then the number, the key result from Sugimoto is that the number of nanocrystals that you end up with is very similar to the number of nanocrystals you nucleate at the beginning, which has everything to do with the rate at which you generate your growth monomers in situ. So if you have, in principle, more reactive precursors and you're in this sort of diffusion-limited growth, you could end up making smaller dots. It mattered because my student, Philippe Green, looked carefully at these reactions. He ran them under dilute conditions to slow them down. And he looked at the emission of these. And what he saw was not one fluorescent species, but two. And so on the plot on the right, that are emission spectrum visible and infrared with time running from top to bottom. And what he saw was that something appeared at 750 nanometers, it was broad. And then you can see after about 100 or 200 seconds in this reaction, 
kind of the growth of a redder feature, which is the nucleation and growth of the quantum dot. You can see arcing off into the infrared is the emission from the less of the real nanocrystals that are be emitting at redder wavelengths as they grow progressively larger. But what was going on? Why are there two things here? Why and we don't see a bimodal distribution at the end? We end up with only quantum dots. So something we could do is we could quench this reaction halfway through. We could look at what we have. We found that you know the precipitate that comes out of this reaction after we work it up looked like relatively small lead sulfide nanocrystals. But in the supernatant, we get something that was red. And to cut quickly to the chase, it was very small. It was very metastable. It was extremely lead rich. And it didn't look like a quantum dot. So I cannot stand here and say that we have guaranteed that it's a cluster, but it looks like uh, kind of the reaction intermediate or pre-nucleation cluster that is often alleged in this field. So compelling about this is if we did an illustrative experiment like this, where we did three separate sulfur in injections into the synthesis, what you can see is that every time we inject precursors, we get the rise and fall of what we're calling the cluster and another nucleation event. But every rise and fall looks the same. If you take these spectra through time, it has an entirely reproducible spectrum. We can go through and shows that it converts into something like the nanocrystal through an isospecific point and that it precedes nanocrystal nucleation and eventually all of the clusters are consumed. They're metastable and once you run out of clusters, nanocrystal growth stops. What we found going through the usual synthetic handles are although we could change the cluster kinetics to an extent with temperature and precursor concentration, stoichiometry, the usual synthetic handles, it was ever present. And I really give a, a tip to the work done by Brandy Koster and her group on indium phosphide where this kind of two-step growth from a, a solved cluster intermediate shown. So then why did this matter for our energy flattening store? It's because two-step growth worsens size dispersity. And you could think of this quickly by just, you know, it's Lemur, you're adding an extra kinetic step that's going to convolve your nucleation kinetics, and so it's going to make more of a mess. You can think about it if you want a small nanocrystal, you would have to quench the growth while there were still nano, new nanocrystals nucleating. And so you wouldn't take advantage of the fact that you've had this starting gun to get all your growth going, and then all your dots end up the same size. But I would encourage people to move towards the richer Sugimoto type picture, as, as many in the field are doing. And that's thinking about it this way, is that the formation of the metastable clusters competes for resources with the formation of nanocrystals. And that the formation of clusters suppresses the initial rate of true, stable, durable nanocrystals so that it's effectively necessary to obtain small T's. If you think about it this way, all of the precursor material that's stored in the clusters is going to end up on the nanocrystals. So if you haven't nucleated as many, they are going to end up large. But this could just be me saying this until we did experiments. Because, of course, if this cluster species exists and we have this evidence, we should be able to manipulate it. And one thing that we can do is attack it with primary amines, right? It's been shown that these promote the displacement of Z-type ligands from lead sulfide nanocrystals. It's been shown to destabilize the indium phosphide clusters from the cluster group. So what did it do here? To cut a long story short, it radically alters the reaction kinetics. So you can see at the top, the traditional reaction where we have two species in extremely slow nucleation and growth, and under conditions that are otherwise identical but for the presence of allylamine, we have a reaction that's over in a minute, we have extremely rapid nucleation, and we have much smaller particles at reaction completion. And what this looks like, if I can put up a cartoon, is that because we have suppressed the clusters, note that we never see any fluorescence associated with clusters, we allow a much higher concentration of the molecular intermediate, the true growth monomer, to show up so that the reaction is done in a hurry. And we now have this higher uh, generation rate of precursors so that we get rapid nucleation. But we can tune this a little more, right? We, we're looking into the reaction mechanism, and what we found is that this is very clearly dependent on the pKa of the primary amine. And so you can go through, we use a number of different species, and what we found a general trend is that the higher the pKa, the smaller ultimately the dot, 
and the stronger the suppression of cluster. And I don't want to bore you with the kinetics and this sort of thing, but this also goes further, right? This supports a mechanism where the formation of the clusters relative to the nanocrystals can be tuned. That branching ratio can be perturbed by additives, and that it's not just amines. We have work under review on glycol ethers showing that there's a multidentate uh, chelation effect that can suppress the clusters, and that this really is a new handle that you can use separate from temperature, separate from your stoichiometry, many of the other things that you want to do with your ultimate nanocrystals to allow you to get the right size and to get it reproducibly. The proof of the pudding is in the baking. We wanted to get into this to flatten the atmosphere, did we? And the answer is yes. So this is the prior literature. And this is what we were able to achieve. By suppressing the cluster, we obtained consistently better polydispersity for all nanocrystals less than four nanometers, and we retained this reliably. In fact, for people who know lead sulfide well, we were able to make lead sulfide nanocrystals with clear excitonic peaks with a short wave thickness of 560 and with emission in the red. So with this, we're going to be implementing these in our upconversion devices, and we're now using these dots uniformly in our other work. However, I want to turn the attention to the second half of the top, which is the discussion of our work on the triplet fusion process in a molecular dimer. And so here, this is part of our challenge. We're really interested in the idea of tethering acceptor fuser molecules to the surface and try to have all-in-one triplet fusion upconversion nanoparticles. And so at the end of the day, we wanted to do this nanocrystals, but we wanted to start with uh, Professor Niels Dimerer at UC Boulder had this, this material that had been studied uh, coming out of his work on single dexedon fission, and it was a terrible fizzer, and so we wanted to see what it was as a fuser. So that we could hone in on the properties of the annihilator itself, we ended up pairing it with a classic palladium thalcyanine so that we could study the fusion itself. And so just to be clear, we're exciting this in the red, we're looking for emission, and you can see it by, uh, I love this science piece, you can see right away if you're on track, you can see at the right that we have a photograph with a 730 nanometer light coming in, and the dimer doing up conversion at 540. And at the time, there hadn't been very many reports of dimeric up conversion, but I highlight a couple of the other examples on the right. So we could go through a bunch, you know, I, there, there's a, a large photophysical study that we ended up doing, but, but I want to summarize this briefly. It was interesting that the rigid dimer upconverts. And for those of you who like to think about electronic coupling, look at that dimer. Not only is it rigid and can't get close to each other, it's not slip stacked and they're almost orthogonal to each other. In fact, the coupling between the two singlet states is so small that you hardly see any difference between the absorption emission spectrum of the monomer and the dimer. But yet it still fuses. It's actually quite uh, an interesting design motif if you can take a uh, chromophore that's already very good at emitting and then put it together in a way that allows it to upconvert but does not wreck its emissive properties. Then we went along with said, you know, well, we didn't save the world. This dimer was only about as bright as rubrine, which is about the state of the art, and that, you know, its sterics and its large molecular weight make it a relatively poor triplet extractor. I mean, in this case, we're diffusing around in solution, and it wasn't great at getting excitations away from the, the palladiated pore. But then we thought a little more. If it's a really bad triplet extractor, which we could see from stirred bormer, but it's still about as bright as rubrine, it actually must be a much more efficient triplet fuser. And that's interesting. We didn't actually expect that we'd be able to have so much control over there. And in a system like a rigid molecular dimer where we can really know something about the geometry, that was, that was intriguing, right? Can we use molecular design to do a little bit better? And when we studied this a bit more closely, we ended up learning more. And so I want to put on the left, these are the plots of the, the intensity of the upconverted emission compared to the pumping intensity. As you can see, going from left to right, we in generally have the second order regime where we're below the threshold, the linear regime where the upconverted emission goes linearly with the uh, excitation intensity, and we have good performance. And we do this as a series of the annihilator concentrations so we can unravel what's going on between the triplet extraction, the collisions efficiency, and the fundamental triplet fusion dynamics itself. We actually thought that this method was quite interesting. Most of the studies in the literature tend to study the, the uh, sensitizers because that porphyrin chemistry, beautiful chemistry, was much harder. But there hadn't been as much work looking at the annihilator side. So we wanted an apples to apples comparison, and this is what we did. And what we did, if you work out the rate equations, you note that the progression of the linear threshold, so the intensity at which you get linear regime, as a function of the concentration annihilator, actually gives insight into the underlying 
kinetics. So even though you can't study those kinetics well because they're all convolved with the diffusion, you can kind of see evidence of their behavior. And what we saw is that uh, in, in this kind of metric we came up with that's very useful, one over the threshold power is that the threshold reduces as you get increased concentration, as you would expect, the more annihilators you have, the better you are at removing excitations from the sensitizer. And that that goes, but then rapidly plateaus. So then we think, well, that happens when you have so many annihilator molecules in there that you've extracted all the excitations that you possibly can. But then we compared this to normal monomeric annihilator emitters and saw a different trend. First, in the monomers, the plateauing wasn't as sharp, and we noticed that the dimer conspicuously outperformed the monomers at low concentrations. So of course we thought something was wrong, so we built a big kinetic model. And what we found is we could perfectly capture the behavior of the monomers with only a single fit parameter based on Stern-Volmer quenching for triplet extraction, known phosphorescence light times, etc. But we could not reproduce the behavior of the dimer unless we used a non-physical K-tet, so the rate of triplet quenching, which we knew was wrong because we had the Stern-Volmer data in hand. And this was really surprising, right? We usually thought of these reactions as being essentially diffusion control, and as soon as the monomers get together, whatever is going to happen is going to happen. And we didn't think that we'd had an interesting handle control this using molecular design. But thinking more closely, we had came up with a hypothesis that we think is what's going on here. So I just want to explain that briefly in some work that's underway. In short, it's important to remember what makes the dimer different. And particularly, it's that in this rigid dimer, we have the ability to host two molecular excitations. You could even call it the bi-exciton with relative ease on the single molecule, right? There are two available pi to pi star transitions. So you have your four electrons to make the quote unquote triplet pair. And this means that the entire spin manifold of this four electron state is available. The spin quintet triplet pairs aren't energetically forbidden as they would be if you were on a single monomeric annihilator. And better still, because the coupling is so weak, I emphasize briefly of the singlet, we expect that the triplet-triplet coupling is even weaker still, that this entire manifold of nine states are well within KT at room temperature. And so we said, if that's the case, and we suspect that's the case, and two other things are the case, we think we can explain what's going on. So something else that we're aware of is in these materials, spin defacing happens. It happens on order 10 nanoseconds. This is some beautiful work they come out of Frankel Chris Bardeen's lab on this and some work that Niels has done on separate materials using single fission. But that the defacing is not symmetric. So that if you had a state that started in the spin quintet manifold, it is more likely to couple to the spin singlet manifold because of symmetry considerations than it is to make the triplet. And this is interesting. So in the normal scheme, if you had two molecular excitations coming together, they are spin uncorrelated, they would form these nine states with equal measure. And if nothing could happen, the spin quintets are very forbidden from decay. They'd essentially, you know, sit around until they fell back apart into spatially uncorrelated triplets. However, if the excitations had hang around for long enough, it is more likely that the spin quintets can form the emissive singlet then to form the overall triplet state, which is a terminal pathway because the excited spin triplet manifold will just relax into a single triplet rapidly quenching one of your two excitations. So this got us into a time scale. If we think that the two excitations on the dimer can hang around for more than 10 nanoseconds, it's possible that you could get a beneficial involvement of spin quintet triplet pair converting into emissive singlets. So this then suggested a diffusion. And if we worked out from the diffusion contents, if the concentration was less than about 0.5 millimolars, that means if, you know, basically having got two excitations on the dimer, it was likely to do the spin defacing before it collided into another molecule and gave up one of its excitations. And so just putting this in crudely with a spin statistical factor that changed from a one quarter probability of getting the emissive excitation at high concentrations to a six ninth, so a fully beneficial triplet. And we're extending this because it's certainly more complicated than that in terms of the fractionation of the single character amongst these nine states. But we ended up with a model that start looking a lot more like our data, suggesting that maybe at these low concentrations, there is a beneficial role for the spin quintet state 
if you can keep it long enough. And what's really exciting about this is if you have the ideal case where you have one of these triplet fusing dimers stapled onto the surface of a nanocrystal, they're as isolated as that can be. And that means that we might be able to beat the nominal 25% cap on the efficiency here that comes from a naive reading of spin statistics. And so these research is very much ongoing. So with that, I'd like to wrap up and of course, thank the people who do all the work. So not just uh, the people in my own group uh, at the University of Toronto, particularly Christian and Phil, who you can see second and third from the right, who did the work on the uh, colloidal structure, or the, the colloidal growth of lead sulfide and the spin dynamics in the triplet dimer systems, but also our collaborators, both present and past and funders for acknowledgement. And I just lastly like to have about my student, Manal Hashim, who's going to talk about a completely different direction. So this is really looking at the dynamics of higher interfaces. We're trying to understand quantum dots and particularly, you know, blinking. We think that, that these trap dynamics are pathological uh, and something that we need to address to get these systems better. And he's going to be giving a talk in this symposium later on. All right, with that, thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to the questions.